Well, good morning, beloved. How are you? So good to see you once again. This is your good friend, Eric Rose, here all the way from Escondido, California. And today we are going to press into deliverance part two. And we're going to talk about uh, just how to deal with some identity issues. And uh, how many of us know, for the most part, that tends to be probably the most um, prominent area concerning dealing with deliverance is people how to re-identify themselves in Christ versus them identifying themselves concerning their past. Now, we all have a past. It doesn't necessarily mean that we have to stay attached to the past concerning negativities, concerning things that have been spoken over our lives in the past that play some type of part in our future now. And so we're going to just discuss and we're going to look at ways that we can just um, through practicality learn how to stay rooted in our identity in Christ when the enemy wants to tempt us in moving backward in the past. Stay tuned, beloved. your good friend brother Eric here all the way from Escondido California and uh, I want to press into something real quick uh, won't be before you long but just remember that we're gonna have a couple of series here that will kind of stretch out and we'll will elongate this teaching so that you can kind of go back and you can have some reference points um, concerning how to live in a life of victory in Jesus Christ and something that um, we should be concerned about and, and um, I wouldn't say concerned, but something that we should have a regular check in concerning why we serve the Lord. You know, a lot of people have different reasonings for why they follow the Lord, why they accepted Christ. Maybe somebody invited them down to the altar. Maybe someone invited them to church. But here's the thing. When you invite someone to church, you should have already led them to Christ. It is not the pastor's job to lead your friend to Christ or your coworker or family member. But because you as a believer have enough Christ in you, you should be confident and bold in being able to lead that person to Christ. And you simply bring them to the house of God to be trained and released into what they have already received. Amen. But we tend to uh, get it backwards and um, we put all of the weight on the pastor. But here's the thing. The pastor doesn't go to work with your coworker. The pastor doesn't live right next door to uh, your neighbor. Uh, or your friend, but the, the, they are people, the, these are people that you come in contact with day in and day out in your sphere of influence, amen, which means you have influence whether you believe you do or not. You do not have to be a scholar or a pastor or a prophet or a fivefold minister to administer the gospel in a healthy way that will lead someone down the path of total victory in Jesus Christ. And we all know and we understand that the pathway uh, to following Christ is a journey. It's a it's it's a it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. Amen. But we need to always check the uh, awareness uh, and the why to why we serve God. Uh, we see in the Gospels that the disciples had different reasonings to their ambitions, and we can find this in Luke twenty two and twenty four. You know, as they reasoned among themselves, often in each other concerning who would be seated next to Christ in his kingdom 
and this we find in Luke 24 and 15, all of them, not just Peter, ended up forsaking Christ and being scattered in the night of Christ's arrest. And we read about this in Mark 14 and 15. Now, there was something within each of the disciples that were still questioning not only who Christ was, but they were questioning who they were. Why, why am I following this man? Like, I'm seeing the signs, miracles, and wonders that he's doing. But yet, I, I hear as we go through the towns that everyone has a different opinion and a different thought process of, of who this man is, you know? And, and it's starting to get to me. And it's starting to cause me to even doubt why he even chose me in the first place. Like, I don't have any leadership skills. I'm not a leader. Like, I, I, I'm still trying to figure out who I am. And all of these are valid reasons. And it really explained the human psyche of when we don't have or we don't have recognition of who we are and what we've been called to do. We can some, we can sometimes begin to veer off into uh, other people's opinions and identities of who they think we are. Has that ever happened to you? I know that's that's happened to me. Uh, wrestle with with that for quite some time. Um, but in the midst of that, we tend to see that the disciples were actually blinded by their own ambitions and assumptions of what Christ came to do, that they did not pay attention to the warnings and heeds in their teaching moments. Sometimes we can get caught up in our own ambitions and our own assumptions and we can drive these things home. And what ends up happening is we end up following a false Christ. We end up following an Americanized Jesus. We end up following a Jesus that um, that has to meet every need. And if he doesn't meet that need when I want him to meet that need, then I don't believe in who he is. And Christianity is just a bunch of cry. Uh, do you know anyone uh, that thinks of this way? Uh, even I thought of this way, and the Lord had to really deal with me and rebuke me uh, for my private ambitions and my motives as to why I was serving him. And this really did have a major play and factor into me wrestling with my identity in him, which caused me to venture and veer out into different areas that had nothing to do with Christ, but was really just a false, uh, I was just presented false variables and I it was easy to choose one simply because I had false ambitions already and motives that were not rooted in the heart of Christ. You know, so Jesus came with not only the power to defeat and re, a, a resisted power of sin and to have a showdown with the ancient human trafficker, because that's really what Satan is. He's a he's a human trafficker. You know, he traffics people in through in throughout the system of sin. And he keeps them in bondage and he keeps them held down. And sometimes we have a hard time being able to relate or being able to administer healing and deliverance to someone who has been so bound for so long. It can almost seem impossible as if there is uh, uh, no other way to, to pull them out. But here's the thing. There is no power of sin. There is no sin. There is no mindset that Christ himself cannot bend and break in the authority that he stands in because he came to destroy the power of sin, the ability uh, uh, to live a holy lifestyle, to live a sanctified and pure lifestyle resides in the identity of Jesus Christ. Glory be to God. The enemy, I'm sorry, Christ also came in the authority of a slave. Now, we must remember that a slave in that time was considered a servant and was uh, someone who actually turned themselves in. And I've done a teaching about this. If you go back uh, through uh, my teachings, I taught about. Uh, becoming a love slave and I talked about the history 
the historicity of slaves and that slavery was not something that God condoned. It was something that man um, created out of his own uh, pride and his own selfish ambitions and evilness. Okay. But Christ came as a servant. Um, he was someone who carries the anointing to care for and to serve other people. Remember, he says, and it talks about in Matthew 20 and 28, that he came to serve, not to be served. Amen. But slavery is simply the twisted perversion of one who serves in compassion and purity. The enemy perverts that term slave uh, for the sake of man uh, fulfilling his own selfish ambitions. OK, but we as a body are now reaping because of this, the harvest of a disgruntled generation who seeks answers because we have preached behind pulpits a false gospel that turns Jesus into the one who did what had to be done in order to save us from hell. That because Jesus said it is finished, we all of a sudden do not have to fellowship in his sufferings and live the cross shaped life he commissioned us to live. Christ suffered for me, so I don't have to suffer now. Christ obeyed, so I don't have to obey. Christ laid his life down, so I don't have to lay my life down. This mindset, however, is why we see a splintered body with very little light, very little power, and a very little salt. You know, that really resonates or should resonate with you by the fact that we are not seeing the body of Christ moving in resurrection power, power to heal, deliver, and save those who Christ said could be saved. Could it be that, that we have, we've come under such a spirit of slothfulness and laziness in the body of Christ that because Christ did the hard thing that no other human could do, which was carry his cross and lay on it and allow others to drive nails through his hands and through his feet. Is it possible that because Christ walked and he wandered in the wilderness for 40 days and for 40 nights to be tempted by the enemy, is it possible that we don't have to wander in the wilderness at times in our lives? That we're exempt from uh, from praying and from fasting we're exempt from disciplining the body we're we're exempt from not having to practice the principles of the holy law the word of god is it possible i i think that we have misconstrued a lot of what we have heard um from behind pulpits simply because it's come out of a spirit of pride we have toned down the gospel we have embraced progressive christianity we have embraced um a, a greasy grace gospel uh for the fact that we don't uh it, it's difficult for us to to suffer now simply because all we know is to do is to only just receive. That's all we know how to do now is to receive. We don't know how to bleed. We don't know how to bleed well. There's a difference between bleeding unhealthy and bleeding well. When you bleed well, you bleed to heal and you bleed to for, for that bleeding to be sealed so that you can be healed, okay? When you follow Christ Jesus, okay? When you accept him as your Lord and personal savior, you're going to receive lashes for him. I was just talking about this actually to my barber uh, yesterday that, you know, I was talking about the difference between a disciple and a convert, you know, that um, in order for you to, to be converted, you, you need to become a disciple. They taught this in the ancient church that, you know, they didn't call you a believer unless your life mimicked that of Christ. You could have come, you could come into the community as a believer, but you were not considered a follower of Jesus Christ until your fruit actually matched that of the character of Jesus Christ. And what we need to understand is that 
in aspects of the identity, um, there are people and there are things that we will tend to attach to for the sake of not having to attach to Jesus Christ. Now, we find it interesting that when we look at the prophet Isaiah, you know, when Isaiah had his encounter with the Lord, um, he discovered new information about himself. There's something about when you encounter the raw glory of Jesus Christ and you have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus Christ, one of the very first things that you're going to realize, if you do have this, if you ever do come into an encounter with Jesus Christ, just, just know that it's something that you can't prepare for. Uh, example, when I had my face-to-face -face encounter with Christ, um, I was at one of my lowest points in my life. I was in a very, very deep depression. I had no grid to even understand the concept of um, being ready to face uh, the Messiah. And you think about it the same with the same with Paul. Paul was on his way to go and persecute more people in the faith. He had no grid for uh, knowing who Christ was, but because of uh, the call on Paul's life and because of the mantle that he ended up catching from Stephen when he was stoned, um, he had an encounter at Damascus and he was nowhere prepared spiritually or physically for that encounter, which means that there are people who are like, you know, and if I could just see Jesus, I would believe him. If I could just touch him, if I could just see some type of, you know, some type of physical manifestation. If he would just answer my prayers, then I would believe in him. Well, that's not faith. Jesus told uh, Thomas, he said, listen, blessed are you, but even more blessed are those who have not seen me and believe in me. Okay, so faith is the substance of things hoped for. There's nothing wrong with hoping to have a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus or to meet him or to see him. But faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Meaning that it's going to require your faith to be increased in order to know that even though you cannot feel God at times and you cannot see him with the physical eyes, it does not mean that he is not there. When Isaiah had his encounter, his face-to-face -face encounter with the great Jehovah, Again, he began to understand that there's some things about him that were out of alignment with who Christ was. Amen. And it says that he was undone. And that means uh, it's, it means to cease. It means to cut off, to destroy, to perish. So there was a part of his identity that he realized that he did not need, that he had been walking in that identity for so long. He also said that he was unclean once again. So that is one of the things, one of the markers to know when you've had a face-to-face -face encounter with the Lord, you are going to be aware fully of how sinful and wretched you are. Not in a condemning way, but in a way to understand that you are standing in the presence of pure holiness. You are standing in the presence of a whiteness that you have never encountered. This is not your typical white light. This is not your typical white paper. This is a white, this is a glory that you have never encountered before. Is it possible that Isaiah had been leaning on his relationship with King Uzziah as security? Because you got to remember that, you know, Israel was led into captivity um, and their enemies constantly seem to have the upper hand over them. And so, it, you know, I think if I was a Jewish boy or, an, or, or, or a young prophet and I was given favor in the sight of my enemy, the king, I think there's some part of me that would uh, want to glean on and off my position to, as a servant to the king to make sure that my head stays attached to my body or that I don't have to live in the very gutters of the prisons like the rest of my fellow kinsmen or live in an impoverished area. But I would, I think I would make sure that I, I, I would have some type of security uh, in my position 
And so Isaiah was a prophet in the king's court of Uzziah. But the Bible says when, uh, but the Bible says that Isaiah said, when King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. So I think that's interesting that as uh, the culmination of Uzziah's life ends, Uzziah sees the Lord. Is it possible that Uzziah's death was a crisis and a challenge for Isaiah? When this long-term king died, Isaiah had a fresh discovery of his need and relationship for God. All of us, we are in need of a refreshing, a resetting, and a redefining. And that redefining, beloved, is going to come when you marry your identity and you step into a union with Christ Jesus. There are 15 cognitive distortions that the human psyche encounters on a day-to-day -day basis on how we think, how we process, and how we view life. I'm not going to take the time now to go through all 15 of those, but I assure you that in some point in time, you have thought even or looked at yourself through at least three of these cognitive distortions. And unfortunately, these cognitive distortions come from us uh, occurring and, and reoccurring and, and going through aspects in our life that were unhealthy, that we had no answers for, and it's and it, it, it outright just evil at times, simply because for the sake of, of, of humanity, uh, there are moments where we suffer at the hands of someone else's greed, of someone else's ego, of someone else's lust. We suffer at the hands of that. And a lot of people believe that there's no way that God is loves me or sees me. Why would he allow this to happen to me? Well, it really speaks about the area of us being overcomers. Wait, you mean to tell me that Christ would allow me to suffer? For the simple fact, I, I had to go through that so that I could be an overcomer? Well, if we are in Christ Jesus, he has guaranteed that if we want to reign with him, we must, must suffer with him. We must mimic the life that he walked. Amen. And so, beloved, I hope that you are understanding that there is a process. There, there are layers that the Holy Spirit will begin to go through your soul one encounter after an encounter after encounter and this is why for the sake of family that we gather for community because within our community holds a concept of healing and deliverance that we will never get if we were just by ourselves now granted there is a level of healing and deliverance that you can go through with christ alone one of the, some of the best encounters i've had is just with christ alone but the Bible says that we should confess our sins to one another so that there may be healing for our souls. And our soul is comprised in the totality of mind, will, and emotions. And because our mind, will, and emotions have been attacked, have been damaged, have been uh, pierced, have been severed at times through atrocities in our past, um, there is a healing that takes place. There, there, there is a, a level of healing that resides in, in relationship. You know, this is why John says, listen, I wish that you would prosper and be in good health, even as your soul prospers. Humanity, even in the midst of, of evilness and greed, God has placed within humanity a level and a portion of healing that you could get nowhere else. And this is the beauty of God's creation. You are you, you are his beauty. You are his his masterpiece. And granted all we tend to see is just the flesh the fleshly side or uh uh the bad side of humanity. Humanity there is a beauty that lies within humanity. When you listen to music, when you look at the masterpiece of an artist who has created something just from just from a, a, a vision that they've had, you are witnessing the awe of God. There, there's an, an overwhelming emotion that stirs, that stirs you to believe that, wow, hope is here. Hope is alive. Hope is now. And he is hope. So beloved, be encouraged to know 
that just because you don't have all of the grid and all of the pattern concerning who you are now in Christ Jesus, know that you will. Know that he will complete a work that he has begun in you. And it's a beautiful work. I guarantee you that. May be a painful work. May uh, may at times be a lonely work. Uh, may be a discouraging work. But all of this is a part of the journey to walking on the highway of holiness. Amen. So, beloved, I hope this is ministered to you concerning identity. Uh, you be blessed and just know that deliverance is the children's bread. Amen. And deliverance is not uh, something that you have to beg for. It belongs to you because it's a sign and a wonder that you belong to God and that those demonic entities that have squatted on your territory and your property do not belong to the property of God. No one can be possessed. They can only be oppressed. Possession means that someone else owns that property. But guess what? But because we saw the demoniac saved, we saw Legion cast out. We saw Mary Magdalene who had eight demons. Uh, uh, it, uh, uh, we, we, saw, we saw her demons leave. That means that the enemy has no control that there's only a, it's it's only a matter of time before he has to be served his eviction notice and a person's been set free why because the blood of jesus came to set humanity mankind free from the atrocities and the torment and the bullying of the enemy so beloved i love you you be blessed god bless you and shalom